fellow BSPers, online attendees, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon. Welcome to the BSP Research Academy Research Adel. I'm Vic Deloro and I will be the moderator for today's public seminar series. Kindly note that the seminar is being recorded and live streamed on the BSP's FB page. Mr. Carl Francis C. Maliwat will present their paper entitled Remittances from Overseas Filipinos in the Time of COVID-19, Spillovers and Policy Imperatives. After his presentation, a Q&A will follow. For the online participants, you may type your questions in the chat box. Let me now introduce the speaker. Mr. Carl Francis C. Maliwat, F, as he is fondly called, is a research associate at the BSP Research Academy. He began, his, he began with the BSP as a central bank associate under the inaugural cohort of the Young Professionals Program in October 2020. F is an economist, and his research interests revolve around development, inequality, and consumer behavior. He earned his master's degree in development economics and bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics, where he developed his interest in undertaking research. He also holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from the Cesar E. A. Virata School of Business, University of the Philippines. F is also training to become a data scientist and is pursuing a second master's degree, this time in data science, from the Asian Institute of Management. F, you now have the floor. You have 30 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, Sir Vic, and good afternoon, everyone. I am... Sorry, let's just wait for my presentation to show up. There we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Francis from the BSP Research Academy, and it's my pleasure to present our paper entitled Remittances from Overseas Filipinos in a Time of COVID-19. Um, before I proceed with the discussion, um, I would like to first introduce the research team who worked on the paper, because the research huddle is not just about presenting research outputs, but also about featuring um, researchers, putting researchers in the spotlight. So the team is composed of Dr. Sid Tuanyo Amador, former BSP Deputy Governor and former head of the BSP Research Academy, uh, Ms. Oni Bayangos, who is our principal researcher and lead author of the paper. And we have Meg Romarate over there, um, our newly minted back officer for and yours truly. Um, actually, this paper was um, presented also at the um, third Asian Economic Development Conference, and I, I am proud to flex this fact today. Um, this conference was organized by the Asian Development Bank Institute and the University of Tokyo, and it was held last July in Tokyo, Japan. So Ms. Oni sent me to present on behalf of the team as she had a separate presentation ongoing in Canada. And I have so I have her to thank for giving me the chance to present and pretend like I am a smart person around PhD holders and PhD candidates worldwide. So this version of the paper was completed in 2022 when we were still reeling from the in initial outbreak of the pandemic. So three years after the fact, we are on the road to recovery, but this road has proven to be quite difficult to traverse. Uh, on the topic of remittances, I have read a few news articles saying that there was a, grow a slowdown in the growth of remittances over the past two quarters, I think. And there is a dampening in growth outlooks with, res with respect to remittances that started this June or July. So the lessons of this paper remain relevant under present circumstances. So having said that, let's begin. Okay, before the pandemic struck, remittances were at an all-time high. Back in 2019, uh, remittances to low- and middle-income countries reached a record high of $554 billion dollars which exceeded official development aid flows. So when the pandemic hit, expectations of a sharp contraction in remittances worried policymakers in countries that rely substantially on this type of flows, given the various macroeconomic uh, implications, such as those on private consumption, the balance of payments and exchange rates. Now, remittances are important, particularly in the Philippine context, as they are an attractive source of foreign exchange. In terms of share to nominal GDP, 
remittances are second to external borrowing, and they also exceed foreign direct and portfolio investments combined. And stability tests show that remittances have been broadly stable since 2010 and are thus a more dependable source of funding than other private capital flows. So a sharp contraction in remittances may actually just be destabilizing given how reliant large sectors of the Philippine economy are on this type of flows. So that actually establishes our motivation for conducting this inquiry. Having said that, these are the research objectives that we had in mind as we conducted our study. First, we wanted to examine the impact of the pandemic on overseas remittances. Uh, next, we sought to determine how a shock in remittances spills over to the rest of the economy, particularly on the labor market, the financial uh, sector, and on the real sector. And finally, we assessed the implications on policymaking with respect to remittances. Okay, we begin our analysis with some salient facts. So here I, I show that um, I mentioned earlier that in 2019, global remittances reached a record high. Um, that was actually around $654 billion, according to World Bank data. So if you break this down on a regional basis, we can see that remittances are largest in the Europe and Central Asia region, which is the light blue area or the light blue bars, um, followed by the Asia Pacific region, East Asia and Pacific region where the Philippines is. Um, in 2020, the level of remittances worldwide was only 1.2% lower than in 2019, much smaller than the 7% decline originally forecasted. So this, um, this is represented by this solid yellow line. And as you can see, the dip is actually very close to zero. It's not as large as originally thought. Um, this decline in transfers was notably smaller during the decline recorded during the global financial crisis. Um, and on a regional basis, the contraction of personal remittances to Asia-Pacific economies, um, is dark, the dark blue line somewhere there, is also considerably lower than the contractions recorded in other regional groups. So that's why the, the, um, when we entered 2020, it, we actually defied expectations of a sharp reduction in the wake of the pandemic for the Philippines particularly, because remittances to the Philippines remain broadly stable in 2020. Um, both personal and cash remittances dropped by only 0.8%. And you can see this in the graph here for 2019 to 2020. The bars are actually fairly level, even though the bar for 2020 is just a little bit shorter. They're still fairly level. And then come 2021, remittances rebounded robustly. Oh, this is for 2019 and 2020. And then for 2020 and 2021, you can see that remittances rebounded robustly, exceeding, exceeding 2019 levels, in fact. So worth mentioning are that during the Gulf War in the early 1990s and the global financial crisis in 08, cash remittances were remarkably strong and they continue to grow despite the crises, uh, but at slower rates. So even way back then, remittances to the Philippines have been resilient to shocks and this resiliency has served as a major force to prop up the economy despite those shocks. We also examine remittances uh, by source country. And off the bat, we can see here that remittances from the United States are the largest. Um, but we should take this with a grain of salt as it is a common practice for remittance centers to course their remittances through correspond correspondent banks, most of which are in the United States. Uh, nevertheless, we can see that remittances actually increased during the pandemic. Remittances from the US actually increased during the pandemic. And if we examine the rest of the economies, there. Oops. Okay. If we examine the rest of the economies and ignore the US for now, we can see that transfers from Singapore, Canada, Hong Kong, Qatar, and South Korea actually increased in 2020 during the pandemic, partially offsetting the declines registered elsewhere. Then in 2021, remittances from all of the countries except for Hong Kong, yeah, except for Hong Kong, increased. So why are there why, 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 how do we explain this relative strength of remittances uh, observed during the pandemic? So we discuss the five shown here. Okay. So first, uh, overseas Filipinos are a heterogeneous group and their motivations, willingness, and capacity to send remittances are varied. So there are those who were more vulnerable to the economic downturn, but there were also overseas Filipinos who were more resilient because they had steady resources of income and the nature of their jobs made them relatively immune to the effects of the pandemic. And these are the overseas Filipinos that have jobs in medical care and personal services. 
Then we also have income augmentation from overseas Filipinos who may have found ways to augment their incomes in order to sustain their remittance sending behaviors during the pandemic. So they may have found second jobs, work longer hours, or switched occupations when necessary. And then we also have income support from targeted fiscal stimuli that may have contributed to steadier remittance flows from countries that adopted such measures, particularly from advanced economies like the U.S. Then we also have the possibility of overseas Filipinos dipping into their accumulated past savings to continue to provide support to their family members back home. As they had been mindful of the economic contraction back in the home front, overseas Filipinos could have been prompted to send more or the same amount of remittances out of their own personal savings to help their households during the time of hardship. And then we also have diversion to rem uh, formal remittances uh, because of the mobility restrictions from uh, that could have hampered access to physical remittance centers. Um, overseas Filipinos may have opted to shift to more formal channels and to digital means. So the shift in flows from cash to digital means uh, a better capture of these digital transactions course through formal channels. And these better capture of these remittance numbers could have supported the recorded remittance numbers. And finally, uh, we have repatriation. And this is one thing that we should, um, we are actually looking into right now uh, because it's been three years after the pandemic and some of these repatriated workers, repatriated workers may have gone back to work uh, back in their uh, host countries. Oh, anyway, repatriation temporarily for some or permanently for others may also be another explanation because um, the number of repatriated workers actually rose during the pandemic. Um, so whether they had come back on a temporary or on a permanent basis, um, their return to the Philippines means that they had sent back their accumulated capital back to the country, back to their families at home as they waited for their next actions or their next uh, deployment. Okay, now we turn to the timing of remittance flows. And this is important to consider as the timing or the cyclicality of, income, of remittance flows could either amplify or moderate income volatility depending on their cyclical behavior. So the issue of income volatility is also important because macroeconomic stability demands, uh, oh no, sustained balanced growth demands macro, macroeconomic stability. Uh, so pro-cyclicality, in remittances has the potential to be destabilizing. In the literature, pro-cyclical remittances are assumed to be driven by self-interest or investment motives. So when the home economy grows, more remittances are sent home to invest in um, financial instruments or uh, physical assets. On the other hand, counter-cyclicality is associated with altruism. So when the home economy is in turmoil, more remittances are sent home to caution from downward shocks to income. So we find bilateral or pairwise correlation coefficients between overseas Filipinos remittances to the real GDP of the countries listed here. Um, also with domestic real GDP and domestic real consumption spending. So as you can see in the table, most of the countries are remittance uh, sending behaviors are pro-cyclical with the real GDP of the host economies, signifying that these host economies can can have the potential to be uh, destabilizing when it comes to remittance sendings, remit remittance sending behaviors of Filipinos to their home to the home country. Because if their economy falls, then their remittance sending behavior will also fall. Um, so it is an important spillover if, uh, channel. And you can also see that remittances are pro-cyclical with the uh, domestic real GDP. Um, yeah, it's also. Uh, pro-cyclical with domestic real GDP. And this indicates that there is an investment or um, self-interest motive that, at play here. But, you also, but if you look at the relationship between remittances and real consumption, there is a counter-cyclical behavior. So um, as you can, what we can surmise from this, these results is that there are competing effects. Um, the, there are competing effects between the altruistic motive and the self-interest self motive. So um, it's not unreasonable to conclude that remittances should decline with the economic contraction brought about by COVID. Um, but we know that the, the correlation tests only deal with bivariate relationships. So the reality is that the relationships are play are much more complex. So we should also consider that when studying the impact of remittances on other sectors of the economy and vice versa, the issue of endogeneity needs to be addressed.
because remittances also form a part of GDP. Okay, so the first research question is as follows. Has the impact of the pandemic been significant? To address this question, we turn to the following reduced form model, which looks complicated, but it simply states that remittances is a function of the following factors, um, domestic GDP, domestic inflation, the difference between the domestic and foreign interest rates, the real effective exchange rate of trading partners, foreign GDP and the growth of domestic liquidity in the home country, and the independent variables are of course lag. So we turn to the generalized method of moments as our estimation method to address issues of endogeneity. Uh, from the aforementioned reduced for model, we use the following variables for in our empirical estimation. And we also include the dummy variable for COVID to explicitly account for the effect of the pandemic on remittances. That's DCOV in the bottom, uh, uh, bottom row. We expect, oops. Yeah, we expect next the following relationships to hold. So first, inflation is expected to be positively correlated with remittances as more remittances can help alleviate the economic burdens of rising prices of goods back home. Uh, next, the interest rate differential is also expected to be positively associated with remittances. This is consistent with the investment motive that we saw earlier uh, when we saw that, pro that remittances are pro-cyclical with Philippine GDP. Uh, if the spread between the domestic interest rate and the foreign interest rate are, is large, investment opportunities on the home front become more attractive, and that's why we expect a positive relationship. Uh, the growth of domestic liquidity, which also serves as a proxy for the level of financial development, is also expected to have a positive relationship with remittances, given that higher levels of financial development create a more conducive environment for transmitting and receiving remittance transfers. And then the growth of the real effective exchange rate, which corresponds a real appreciation is also expected to positive, positively affect remittances because conceptually overseas Filipinos may be induced to send more dollars back home to exploit arbitrage opportunities arising from the overvaluation of the dollar, ceteris paribus. And then we use the business cycle of the United States as our variable for host country GDP, given that the United States is one of the largest, is actually the largest economy. And also because of the fact that most of the remittances are sourced from the United States. And then we expect the COVID dummy to have a negative effect on remittances as the pandemic, as we have seen that the pandemic has had an adverse effect on domestic and global economic activity. Okay, now we show our empirical results in this table. So model one is the baseline model. Model two includes the COVID dummy to explicitly capture the effect of the pandemic. And model three is just model one re-estimated, but without the time period of the pandemic. And immediately you can see that we omitted our domestic real GDP because we uh, found this to be consistently insignificant across all three model specifications. So from the baseline model results, we can see that the inflation rate, the interest rate differential, actually all variables except for the lag of personal remittances are significant uh, and positive determinants of personal remittances. So conformant with our expectations. So given these results, we expect the impact of the pandemic on the growth of remittances to be significant. And we show this by introducing the dummy variable DCOV in model two uh, above the constant term to control for the impact of the pandemic. And as you can see, the effect of DCOV is neg negative and significant, but the coefficient estimate is quite small. And we will discuss why later. You also find that with the introduction of the pandemic dummy, the coefficient estimates of the interest rate differential and the US GDP have become insignificant, suggesting that investment and growth opportunities both in the home front and in the United States have become insignificant. Finally, in model three, we find, uh, similarly to model one, we show that all variables are significant, except that now the constant term has become positive. So, so in model one, you can see that the constant term is negative because that absorb because it includes the time period of the pandemic and the constant term absorbs the effect of the pandemic. Meanwhile, in model three, without the time periods of the pandemic, the constant term is positive because it has not yet absorbed the negative effect of the pandemic in the model. So this only shows, this also proves that the pandemic has had a negative effect on remittances. Okay, 
Okay, moving to the second research question. What are the spillover effects of a shock and remittance test on the real financial and labor markets? So to answer this question, we use impulse response functions from a series of vector autoregression models. So we use the variables from earlier as well as additional variables pertaining to labor market factors, including the minimum wage rate, the labor force, growth uh, in growth and trend forms, and the actual to trend form of employment. And we employ a few uh, orderings as well as uh, no, a baseline ordering, as well as three or alternate orderings uh, in the VAR model to verify the robustness of our Hi. estimations. No. Here, here are the mod uh, orderings I mentioned earlier. Okay, so the following sets of charts will show the impulse response functions of a unit standard deviation shock in personal remittances on all of the variables that I listed here in the slide. So by design of the IRF VAR methodology, the shock represents an upward shock. But since you know that COVID is a downward shock, we can just imagine these charts flip uh, downward to see the downward effect. Uh, anyway, the effect of the the property of symmetry is a uh, uh, inherent in the model, so we can we we can just imagine it exactly flip downward to see the downward effect, uh, the downward the effect of a downward shock rather. So okay, this first set shows the results from the baseline ordering. So as you can see, the shock to remittances. says significantly affects domestic real GDP growth, inflation, the interest rate differential, the nominal peso dollar exchange rate growth, and domestic liquidity growth. And I should also point out the effect of uh, the shock on remittances. So as you can see, there's a lag, there's an effect one period after the fact, but later on, two periods, three periods, the effect disappears. So this shows that the effect, the effect of the shock on remittances is temporary. And it also supports the finding that uh, the, the remittance has recovered immediately in 2021. This next set of charts shows the results for the first alternate ordering. And you can see that the shock to remittance has leads to significant changes in real GDP growth, the nominal peso dollar exchange rate. And then this third, third set shows that real GDP growth, the interest rate differential, and the growth of the real effective exchange rate respond significantly to a shock on remittances. And then in this last set of charts, again, real GDP growth, the interest rate differential, and the growth of the real effective exchange rate respond significantly to a shock on remittances. So across all sets of IRFs, the responses of real GDP growth, the interest rate differential, Actually, just those two variables are consistently significant. And we also find that the response of the labor market uh, factors are not significant. And this may be because of the various measures implemented by the national government to cushion the effect of the pandemic on uh, Filipino workers and their been overseas Filipino workers and their beneficiaries. Okay, so summarizing our findings. First, overseas Filipinos remittances, both cash and personal, are pro-cyclical with the incomes of the Philippines and of major host countries. And from this, we can conclude that shocks such as those seen during the pandemic are expected to reduce both remittances and economic growth. Next, we found that domestic inflation, the real interest rate differential, domestic liquidity growth, the growth of the real exchange rate, and the business cycle of the U.S. economy as a migrant hosting economy are significant factors that drive the growth of personal remittances. Third, we found that the pandemic has had indeed has indeed had a negative effect and a significant effect on the growth of personal remittances. But, and this is crucial, we have found this effect to be temporary. Nevertheless, we find that shocks to remittances do spill over to the rest of the economy. And while the shock to remittances is temporary, the spillover effects may not necessarily be so. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so clearly we find that remittance flows represent a specific and important channel of spillover effects from the global economy. And as such, remittances will continue to exert a significant force in the Philippine economy for the foreseeable future. And because remittances remain a crucial source of funding for the Philippine economy, we really must consider how to leverage or optimize the use of remittances to fuel further economic growth. So we consider the following policy measures. 
First, we declare the provision of remittances as an essential financial service. Second, we support the development and scaling up of digital remittance channels for migrants and families through fintech and digital modes. Third, we continue efforts to reduce remittance costs. And fourth, we enhance the remittance environment by improving transparency and promoting competition in the remittance market. We can also consider developmental interventions, such as to enhance the payments and settlement system, improve access to financial services by promoting the use of the internet and of mobile technology, and to cultivate financial education among overseas Filipinos and their beneficiaries. For its part, and I'm about to conclude my presentation, the BSP has been implementing measures to promote transparency and competition among remittance service providers, as well as to provide financial education to overseas Filipinos and their beneficiaries. In 2006, the, B the BSP issued circular number 534, which requires banks and non-bank financial institutions to post remittance charges, classifications, and costs along with other relevant information for the benefit of remitters and their beneficiaries. Next, the BSP website also serves as a centralized portal to the online landing pages of banks under its supervision, and also provides the respective consumer support hotlines in an effort to promote transparency and accessibility. And then there are financial, no, sorry, consumer financial education campaigns aimed at promoting a culture of savings and productive investment uh, especially among those Filipinos, uh, especially among overseas Filipinos, rather. So one such one such um, program is the Financial Natalino at Kaalaman or the Pitaka program. Uh, the program aims to equip overseas Filipinos with the ability to better manage remittances, get out of debt, and set aside savings so that when they come back home to the Philippines, they have a much brighter future. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Again, on behalf of the research team, I'd like to thank everybody for your kind attention. And now is the time for questions, so please feel free to raise your virtual hands or to leave your questions in the chat box. Thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause to F. Uh, thank you, F, for your uh, presentation and uh, for shedding light on two important research questions. Uh, has the impact of the pandemic on overseas Remittance has been significant, and uh, what are the spillover effects of a shocks in remittances on the monetary, financial, and labor markets? Uh, before I open the, the floor uh, for Q&A, let me just go back to your slide on determinants of remittances, uh, because I noticed that uh, in, in the said slide, you were assuming that uh, remittances are pro-cyclical uh, in in your a priori your your a priori expectation for most of the variables are uh, uh, positive indicating that uh, you are already assuming that remittances are pro cyclical i ask this question because uh, it can actually be uh, it, it's actually an, an, an ambiguous because it's an it's still an empirical issue Yes, sir. So actually, the, the assumptions are not actually a priori. We conducted pairwise correlation tests to see what the to see the relationship between remittances and the GDP. So these are actually empirical findings and not uh, not particularly a priori assumptions. Thank you, F. Uh, I now open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Dr. Fermo. Thank you, Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my, my question actually pertains to something you uh, already mentioned uh, very briefly earlier in your presentation, and that is the um, some um, qualifying or qualifiers are needed when we look at remittances coming from the United States. And um, it is very clear how uh, the magnitude of remittances are counted as coming from the United States. Um, in your, in the literature or in your research, um, you may have encountered uh, uh, in the in for other countries, for example. Um, what could be a uh, you know the best way to correct for this? Um, is there any effort coming from, for example? Uh, the Philippine Statistics 
uh, authority if they are the ones coming out with that uh, data or uh, is it coming from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, for example? Uh, is there is there uh, at least an initiative that has begun in, in trying to uh, maybe um, weave through the data a little bit uh, in order for us to really um, uh, have a sense of how much is coming from the United States and how much maybe it is bigger coming from other countries? Um, this is an important question uh, because it's possible that uh, over time, Perhaps our uh, the the uh, magnitude of remittances from the United States maybe is flat. Uh, I'm just guessing, <laughs> but perhaps over time uh, those coming from uh, the Middle East or other Asian uh, countries, where um, some of our overseas Filipinos are located, for example, Singapore or maybe another um, for a country for that matter, maybe more countries from the Middle East as a source of remittances rather than just coming from the United States. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. And unfortunately, I couldn't provide, I couldn't provide you with a concrete answer because it is a common problem in the literature as well, if I'm not mistaken, Ms. O. Actually, Ms. O would like to answer. Pala. <laughs> Actually, we we discuss this a lot in the research team because um, this has an important implication not just on the data, but also on the results of the um, regressions. But there was this paper which was presented by Dr. Peter Tillman on the remittances coming from um, Latin America, specifically um, uh, Mexico, and uh, uh, there is another country, Bolivia. They also have the same problem because most of the remittances are coursed through the United States because most of the financial centers closed in some of um, um, emerging market economies. So, talaga magko course to the United States. I ask because uh, this is also our problem. I asked doc Dr. Peter Tillman if there is a way of correcting such data. What he said was at the moment, um, it is difficult to correct such data because the data are coming from financial centers in the United States. So parang you have to overhaul the uh, international financial system to correct that. But what you can do, at least in the research, is to specify that and identify that as, a, as an issue. Uh, eventually, when the financial center's uh, uh, transactions could be corrected, then it will um, end up in a more, um, in a more um, correct, yeah, correct uh, data capture. But at the moment, I haven't, um, I, I I don't know of any any uh, measure to correct that because the data are coming mostly from the financial centers in the United States. Neil, you may want to ask your question. Actually, thank you. If actually that's a related research that I'm doing about migration, and maybe to add to Miss Oni and Miss Laura's um, suggestion, maybe you could also think about um, dissecting the National Migration Survey because they have uh, data there on how much they usually give or receive per person and per area. So maybe with that, we could, I'm not sure yet on how you could correct that, but you could also use that kind of survey that the PAS, PSA has. Anyway, back to my questions. I, I have two questions. Number one is, have you compared the, the impact of COVID with other financial crises, like for example, the EFC or the GFC? And uh, what's the difference between those types of crises and with COVID? And then the second one was, um, have you also checked whether like, for example, the number of migrants that we have uh, in the region, per region, like for example, in the Middle East, in the US, or in Asia, whether that could become also a factor why there is no such growth in the um, in the remittances. So like, for example, in recent years, majority of our migrants are 
um, usually domestic workers, unlike before during the 1990s, wherein highly skilled workers like engineers were sent to the Middle East. So maybe that's that could also be a factor why there's such a flat movement or maybe a low growth of remittances. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, very good questions. Uh, for the first one, um, have we compared the effect of the crisis and what were the differences between the crises? Okay. So what we found was COVID was actually, the effect of COVID wasn't actually as big as the effect of the GFC and uh, during the Gulf War. So for some reason, we were the, effect, the remittances were kind of more resilient now than they were before. So on to your next sub-question, what's the difference? Well, COVID is a real shock, whereas the GFC was a financial shock. And I think the Gulf War could also be considered a real shock, but it's not, the, the Gulf War was an isolated, um, no, not isolated, it affected only a certain geographical region which you know, obviously would have spillover effects to other, na- other regions, but COVID in particular was really global in scale. So that's a key difference. But you'd, you'd think that because it's more global, no, that the effect would be bigger, but the effect of the, the shock to remittance has to be bigger, but it's, maybe it's a structural thing. And that moves on to your second question. Um, have we examined the composition? Um, I think it would, be, it would be a good idea to explicitly put it in the paper, the composition, if you could find the data. But the intuitive uh, thinking here is, you're right, because the composition of uh, OFs right now are more on uh, essential services. Because you know, when you say domestic workers, um, healthcare workers, diba? so they are essential workers, and they were really crucial to sustaining economic uh, activity and uh, sustaining the health health situation of everywhere basically and that may that may you're right that may have been a factor why remittances are stronger and as you mentioned and I'm going, that really supports my point that it's a structural thing it's a structural shift in the composition of OFs Ms. Oni would like to add something or Nina <laughs> there's a question from the floor if various reasons, uh, factors come into play for remittance motives, is there scope for this to have been directly identified in the VAR bar model, uh, perhaps through a structural VAR specification or one with sign restrictions? Okay, Ms. Oni would like to answer that rather technical question. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, we talked about it. it that was raised by DG Sid Amador in one of our discussions. We didn't um, consider the structural VAR with uh, uh, restriction, one Vic and Bayon restriction. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is because the impact of the pandemic is so strong that it is very difficult to identify, right? Oh, so what uh, F mentioned earlier on, it's a big shock. So parang nahihirapan kami um, to, to find a definite, definite, uh, um, mo- uh, definite um, narrative for identifying another motive for holding or for, for overseas remittances. But, what we can do, and uh, F and I were discussing it this morning, we could extend the data set to include um, data until 2023. In that sense, baka makakita kami ng magandang narrative using a structural VAR. Uh, but that's a good question. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions from the floor? Uh, there, there, okay, Neil, go ahead. No, so there being none, uh, let, let me uh, join me in, in thanking F for uh, his excellent uh, presentation. Uh, round of applause, please. May I now request the attendees, uh, both online and uh, on site, to answer the feedback survey form, uh, which we are going to flash on, on the screen. Uh, uh, it's taking a while. Uh, yeah, yeah. Coffee, coffee is being served, so you can get your coffee. Uh, coffee and sandwich. 
let, let, let me also thank the online participants. Uh, and uh, please join us in the next uh, Research Huddle seminar. Thank you very much.